Yeah, we're good. Cool. I didn't really know what you were doing, so I wanted to make sure I was just recorded. I was starting the recording and cheering about, like, violence and patriarchy. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's so much of it. There's got to be some art around it. So, to start off with, Catherine Gallagher, a student from Chicago, Illinois, is going to kick us off with violence and contemporary visual arts. She became interested in the subject of her paper after learning about the, art, the artists Kara Walker and Nan Goldman, is that correct? In her contemporary art history class with Dr. Amy Johnson just last semester. She was also interested in including her own artwork that she created during an independent painting study with Louise Captain during the spring of 2017, so about a year ago. She wanted to bring awareness to violence against women, and this paper will be a condensed version of her distinction thesis that she's working on, which is about violence and visual arts. Mm -hmm. So, here we go. <laughs> We're now in <laughs> December 7th. <laughs> well, I guess I, I have made edits. <laughs> no judgment, Catherine. If you had this paper done December 7th for a conference in, what, February, then you're doing better than most faculty, I think. <laughs> Off to a good start. As long as humans have existed, it could be said that violence has existed alongside us. Cave paintings of prehistoric warfare from societies with undocumented histories show death and hunting scenes between men and animals. Thousands of years later, the sentiments of these paintings are more or less depicted through, vi sorry, through violent entertainment. TV shows like 13 Reasons Why are both revered and revolted by audiences for their creativity and possible lack of sensitivity about topics like assault or suicide. Specifically, in the contemporary visual arts, artists who choose to depict violence in their artworks often encounter a double-edged sword. On one hand, the artist wants to promote awareness of an issue they believe is critical in order to educate others. However, their portrayals may be criticized by audiences as confrontational or explicit, ensuring that their message is lost in translation. Two contemporary artists, Kara Walker and Nan Golden, illustrate violence through their use of drawing and photography while I use oil paints. In this essay, I will answer the following questions. What attracts us to violence? What makes violent visual art different than violent entertainment? How do Walker, Golden, and I illustrate violence in our artworks? And what is our greater role as artists regarding violence in society? These answers will provide my unique perspective about violence in contemporary visual arts. In answering these questions, it is most important to first understand humans' exposure to violence. One does not have to watch the news or check social media websites for too long before they stumble upon violence. We interact with violence daily, whether it is by hearing a news report about a shooting or watching a viral video of one person harming themselves or another person. It is arguable that we are desensitized to violence and its cost since it occurs frequently in our society. In the 2015 article, Violent Movies and Severe Acts of Violence, Sensationalism versus Science, authors Patrick M. Markey, Juliana E. French and Charlotte N. Markey examine the relationship between real-world violent acts and violence in movies and video games. The authors concluded that over the past 50 years, film violence and gun violence in PG-13 movies has tripled. Though their results should be taken cautiously because of their small data pool, this clarifies that our exposure to violence has significantly increased and that there may be a correlation between violent entertainment and our desire to watch it. The effects of violent entertainment on youth should also be mentioned. According to James D. Hamilton, author of The Market for Television Violence, research indicates that some children who consume violent programming are more likely to become aggressive, to feel desensitized to violence, or to experience fear upon viewing. This research is important, and sorry, is important to consider regarding the increased amount of mentally ill youth who commit violent crimes due to exposure to violent television or video games at a young age. The overall improvement of graphic design in video games during the past few decades has created images of gunshot wounds, bloodshed, and assault that truly look lifelike. 
This is both a blessing and a curse to the graphic art industry because jobs and graphic design are in hot demand, yet they could have underlying consequences. So, what keeps people coming back for more violent entertainment? It would be unsurprising if the main drive of companies producing this type of material was for monetary gain. Participating with this media may provide viewers with an outlet for their own aggressive behaviors that could otherwise lead to real-life consequences like imprisonment. Another reason for enjoying violence in movies or television shows is jump scares, which causes a spike in adrenaline. With first-person shooter video games, the player's direct assimilation into a realistic environment could further desensitize them to violence and possibly stir in them the desire to commit violent acts themselves with real weapons. If the player does experience a desensitization toward violence, it could become troublesome if their lines blur between reality and fantasy. <laughs> <Are we? laughs> um, next, the difference between violent visual art and violent entertainment should be examined. Though film and music are forms of art, having a physical piece of artwork that one can walk around and view from multiple angles, especially if it shows a violent or difficult encounter between two subjects, questions our traditional definition of fine art. Of course, everyone has their own definition of what they think fine art is, though I believe we generally have defined success successful art as artworks that are technically and aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Artists have been challenging this definition of fine art since its existence. An example is Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith Slang Hall of Beauties. <laughs> Controversial at the time of its creation in the early 1600s because of its gruesome subject matter and the fact that its creator was a woman artist. Though this painting is now regarded as one of the most famous of the Baroque style, we have difficulty accepting artworks that show gory or painful scenes as fine art since their subject matter reminds us of the reality we live in. In modern society, we categorize violent acts like murder and assault as acceptable only in an informative or entertaining context. Outside of that context, the idea of seeing blood and guts should make us extremely squeamish and uncomfortable as it is atypical to what we are used to in our daily lives unless we are any more so. In fact, we view the idea of viewing visual art as an entertaining experience, framing an exhibition around food, drink, and stimulating conversation. Thus, when we view artworks that do not fit into this box of what we think fine art is, that is where, this, that is where the discussion lies. Kara Walker is one contemporary artist that challenges our definition of art. As an African-American woman, Walker expresses her views about the dark history of slavery in the U.S. and the strong undercurrent of racial tension that still exists today. In Gwendolyn Du Bois Shaw's Seeing the Unspeakable, The Art of Kara Walker, her introduction describes the early development of her dissertation-turned-book about Walker's art and the problems Walker confronts about the mistreatment of blacks during the Civil War that the South has tried to paint over as less than humane. Right off the bat, Shaw describes viewing Walker's 1997 exhibition upon, <clears throat> excuse me, upon My Many Masters at the San Francisco Museum of Art, writing, I, too, was stunned by the graphic nature of the piece, its violence, and its hardcore sexual content the way that it seemed to attack the cliches and stereotypes about plantation life that have become a part of the popular understanding of the past. It was a moment of communal visuality in which the act of viewing within the space of the gallery became a spectacular spectacle, in which museum patrons watched other museum patrons <clears throat> watching them back. The artwork Shaw described is <laughs> The end of Uncle Tom and the grand allegorical tableau of Eva in Heaven, in which there are myriad violent acts occurring. On the left side of the piece, a child leaves piles of excrement on the ground as he walks away from the sexual assault happening to another child. The same man performing this assault is also murdering a baby with a sword, while the man depicting Uncle Tom has his fist angrily raised at the sky. Eva has her axe raised above her head about to swing it down onto a third child as two women watch from the side, perhaps too shocked or frightened to intervene. Contextually, Shaw's reaction and the reactions of those around her in the gallery is completely understandable <coughs> since this content is graphic and was probably not anticipated by the museum goers. Furthermore, Shaw's right about the fact that the written and oral histories of slavery and plantation life are often glossed over to mask the plantation owners' horrific crimes of beatings, rapes, and lynching of slaves. 
Reading about the fellow museum goers, looking back and forth at each other in disbelief, brings to mind the expression, stunned into silence. As I can only imagine the sudden quietness that fell over the gallery as everyone tried to figure out what exactly they were seeing and what to make of it. The magnitude of this piece is further heightened by the life-size scale of it and Walker's distinct choice of solely working with black paper on an opaque surface. Another example of Walker's is an earlier piece. Oh, gone. An historical romance of a civil war as it occurred between the dusky thighs of one young negress and her heart. The title of this piece references Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind, a novel about the life of a southern belle on a plantation during the Civil War as she grows up witnessing slavery from a privileged Caucasian perspective. However, the title of this drawing is as close as the two pieces get in comparison since Walker presents her own illustration of slavery to the audience. On the drawing's left side, <clears throat> a man and woman, possibly the slave owner and his wife, tenderly kiss as a child grabs a chicken by its neck. Next to him, a woman sits on the ground, her finger pointed at the child to scold him or her. On top of a small hill, two children participate in Felicio as another child hops from foot to foot at the base of the hill. On the far right, a man and woman are again present, though they appear to be intertwined in some strange sexual or physical attack. This blunt illustration of murder, sex, and personal violation, as seen in the end of Uncle Tom, is startling for its sheer abrasiveness. In both works, Walker presents a visual representation of slavery and disregards the notion of slavery not having any negative consequences far into the present day, leaving each viewer to question what their role and responsibility is in the history of slavery. A recent example that reminds me of Walker's artwork is the movie 12 Years a Slave, which received criticism for its portrayal of slavery from an African American's perspective. Likewise, <clears throat> The photographer Nan Golden challenges the traditional limits of what is considered appealing art. Golden's early life was clotted with pain since she lost her older sister to suicide when she was a young girl. She first became interested in photography as a teenager when she was introduced to the camera by one of her teachers. As a young adult in the early 1970s, she primarily photographed the lives of her friends, many of whom identified with the LGBTQ plus community, participated in drag shows, and used hard drugs. Sadly, many of her friends later died of drug overdoses or AIDS. Arguably, the most famous work of Golden's that illustrates her early career as a photographer is The Ballad of Sexual Dependency. And these are just uh, some images I found that are from oh, the <laughs> uh, series. Uh, the Ballad of, so the, uh, Ballad of Sexual Dependency is a slideshow comprised of 700 photographs set to a soundtrack um, Nan Golden chose. In the 2008 article, The Ballad of Sexual Dependency, authors Catherine Bussard and Lisa Doran write about her innovative piece. They argue that no artist, and certainly no photographer, of this era has created a more symbiotic relationship between life and art than Nan Golden. Viewers see Golden, her friends, and family in moments of utmost intimacy. Love making, violence, addiction, hospitalization, and witness the roller coaster of human emotions that accompany them. This demonstrates the significance that the ballad had on Golden's personal and professional life, as well as her raw approach to documentary photography that had not been seen before in the history of art since she photo photographed those close to her in candid moments. It is plausible that Golden's willingness to photograph such private moments is an invasion of her subject's privacy. One photograph in The Ballad that shows violence is Nan one month after being battered. As the title implies, this photograph is a self-portrait of Golden's facial injuries one month after being beaten by her ex-boyfriend. The reddish-purple cuts and bruises under her eyes are similar in shade to her lipstick color as she stares directly at the camera. The juxtaposition between her strong gaze, closed mouth, and literal open wounds shows the lasting effects of domestic violence, confronts the stigma of being a survivor, and leaves us with several unanswered questions. <clears throat> By deciding to take this photograph, is Golden showing herself to the audience as fragile or empowered? What exactly caused her boyfriend to harm her? Is this a visual warning for other women or people involved in violent relationships that something like this could happen to them? As an artist, I have personally tried to answer these questions in my own artwork. 
and spring semester 2017. I completed an independent study in painting, one of my two studio art concentrations. I originally was not sure what I wanted to paint, but after hearing about the two assaults that happened on Otterbein's campus in the fall of 2016, I was motivated to use my painting talents <clears throat> to bring awareness to end violence against women in our community. In my study, I created six large oil scale, sorry, <laughs> six large, six large scale oil paintings and used reference photos for my subjects. I have found these paintings to be more relevant in the past few months than I thought, particularly concerning the multitude of celebrities and news journalists that have been accused of sexual assault or misconduct. The Me Too hashtag started a worldwide movement of men and women coming forward to share their stories about assault or harassment in the workplace and slash or at home. As a domestic violence survivor, my independent study took on even more significance because I knew what it felt like to be in a painful situation. In my paintings, I also wanted to express the power of the healing process. Another motivation of mine was my desire to help others who are in a similar situation. One painting of mine is titled Self-Portrait. I consider this piece my 15 seconds of fame since it was exhibited this past summer at the Ohio State Fair Fine Arts Exhibition from July to August. I am very proud of this painting for two main reasons. The first is that it was the first painting I created for my independent study, so it holds a special place in my heart. The second reason is that it was seen by a much larger audience in a broader context, thereby spreading my message to all who viewed it. I was so excited for this piece to be displayed because it was chosen over 2,000 other artworks submitted to the exhibition. As I stated previously, I used reference photos for my paintings. The original reference photo I found for this painting was in black and white, but I wanted to add some color and life to the piece. In my version, you can clearly see the subject, a woman, trying to cover her bare chest with her hands. She struggles to do so because there are four red hands invading her personal space, grabbing her by the neck and pulling at her hands to establish control over her. I made the decision to paint these four hands in red because I believe the color red symbolizes power and dominance and to imply that this touching is unwarranted by the woman. The viewer does not know the identity of the woman nor the identities of her assaulters. I chose to keep this anonymity to suggest that this type of situation can happen to anyone, although the woman's blonde hair, light skin, and the painting's title reflects that this has happened to me. Also, I chose to paint all the images in my independent study on top of a black gesso background since it was a technique I had not tried before and because I wanted to use the black paint to create underlying shadows. The black background helps display the layering of paint since I had to put lightness on top of darkness, a complete contrast to how I usually paint by adding color to white canvas. I had difficulty deciding when I was done completing this painting since I am a perfectionist and always think I can change or add <laughs> something here or there to get, oops, to get the results I want. However, I'm glad I love this painting how it is like my professor told me to awkward blue orange and all <laughs> because I have realized that these changes signify my growth as an artist and an individual. I was a bit surprised that this painting was chosen for the exhibition because it revolves around a topic that is not family friendly, yet I soon realized that the jurors looked beyond the message I was trying to send and truly saw it for what it was, a good painting. Historically, I am proud to fit in with the contemporary art movement. I believe I am somewhere in between the artworks of Kara Walker and Nan Golden. I do not think I am as extreme in vocalizing my opinion through my works as Walker is, yet I want the audience to emotionally and mentally connect with my artworks. By depicting violence in my paintings, I am acknowledging that the sexual, verbal, and physical mistreatment of women happens every day and will continue to until we put a stop to it. Like Walker and Golden, I want my paintings from this independent study to start a conversation about ending violence against women and cause my audience to critically reflect on their decisions and what they can do to help change the status quo for the better. It is an unspoken rule in the art world that artists must learn how to deal with negative feedback. In my opinion, the artworks by Walker and Golden, as well as myself, can easily fall into the label of being too explicit or controversial because we choose to present the sometimes ugly side of life. This ugly side is not typically spoken about because it reflects our human nature, that bad people exist and that they do bad things. Through my painting classes, I learned that perfection does not learned that perfection does not exist outside of the canvas or frame. The downside 
of being an artist who depicts violence is that our message may not be received clearly by our audience, or worst case scenario, it could be considered offensive. Labels are worrisome because it forces one to fit into a certain category, Excuse me. automatically presenting that person with the bias. As I learned in my contemporary art history class, our role and responsibility as contemporary artists should be to build bridges between views that we do not agree with in order to foster mutual understanding and respect. Then I believe the artwork we make will truly be effective. To conclude, violence does exist in our society and is not going away anytime soon. Unfortunately, there will always be unjustified murders, assaults, and other heinous crimes, no matter how many rules we have in place. Violent entertainment is not going anywhere either, nor is our desire to actively watch it. I am not sure if the question about our attraction to violence can honestly be answered, though I did provide some context that hopefully makes you think about what you watch in your free time and why. In my opinion, we find art that is not as traditionally visually pleasing, whether in color choice or subject matter, as outrageous. A total disrespect to revered artists like Monet or Picasso, because this type of art makes us think, feel, and reflect. It could be suggested that we are afraid of this art, since it provides a voice to those who may not otherwise have one. Undoubtedly, Kara Walker and Ann Golden challenged this traditional definition of what art is through their depictions of violence. I believe Walker is more forceful in her approach, and Golden is more sensitive. Possibly it is because of their use of mediums, which would be an interesting comparison to make for another time. I find myself somewhere in the middle between them. Not entirely outright, yet not trying to shy away from what message I think should be spread to the world. Nevertheless, these contemporary female artists raise important questions about violence, its role in contemporary art, and our responsibility to each other as humans. With my art, I hope to do the same. Thank you.